As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the One of the most dramatic battles in the conflict between science and religion, the renowned Scopes trial, pitted evolution against creationism and polarized public opinion in America. The theory of evolution argues that organisms physically and psychologically change with the passing of time. Charles Darwin brought the theory of evolution to prominence in 1859 when he proposed the idea of natural selection in his first book, The Origin of Species, and in his second book, The Descent of Man. The idea that humans evolved from earlier species remains controversial to this day and was not widely taught in public education in the United States until the middle of the 20th century. Several American high school biology textbooks published between 1900 and 1920 discuss the theory of evolution, but they ran into conflict with the rise of fundamentalism. The theory of evolution was most controversial in the evangelical South, and Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas actually banned the teaching of evolution. Tennessee's 1925 Butler Act prohibited teaching in public schools that man is descended from a lower order of animals, and it inspired one of the most famous of the conflicts between supporters of evolutionary theory and creationists. Well, the Christian right, as it's termed, didn't really come into existence until by that name in the early 1900s. And before that, there wasn't much need for them to mobilize to influence public education because much of public education reflected Protestant morals and Protestant beliefs. And you know, that started to fade out, and that's why it started to become an issue in the Scopes trial. Um, and I certainly think that the Butler Law was reflective of the Christian rights mobilization. The American Civil Liberties Union at that time was looking for a way to challenge the efforts to ban evolutionary theory in public education and advertised a desire to defend someone in Tennessee accused of breaking the new law. The ad called for a Tennessee teacher who is willing to accept our services in testing the law in the courts. Our lawyers think a friendly test case can be arranged without costing a teacher his or her job. All we need is a willing client. In May of 1925, the business leaders of Dayton, Tennessee, read the ACLU's ad in the newspaper and saw an opportunity to bring publicity and business to Dayton. They asked John Scopes, a 24-year-old football coach and substitute teacher at the local Clark County High School, to allow himself to be charged under the law. Scopes agreed to help, even though he had only been teaching from the state-required textbook, A Civic Biology, which had a chapter on evolution in it. On May 25th, Scopes was indicted for violating the Tennessee law by teaching evolution. After Scopes was indicted, the prominent Baptist minister, William Bell Riley, invited the anti-evolutionist, Bible lecturer, ex-secretary of state, and three-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, to lead the prosecution team. Bryan agreed. In response, one of the most prominent and infamous attorneys of the day, Clarence Darrow, an agnostic, volunteered to lead the team of lawyers defending Scopes. Both Brian and Darrow agreed to take the case because they saw it as an important battle in the conflict between faith and science, Darrow for science and Brian for faith. From Scopes' indictment to the beginning of the trial, the public and media prepared for the coming confrontation. Fruit vendors, lemonade stands, and tourist shops prepared for the influx of spectators. Evangelical tent meetings were held around the town. WGN Radio prepared to broadcast the trial live nationwide for the first time ever. The trial started on July 10, 1925, with the picking of the jury members and a group prayer that Darrow objected to the next day. When the trial resumed on July 13, Clarence Darrow began his defense of science versus religion. This was not what the ACLU wanted him to do. The ACLU wanted him to challenge the law on the grounds that forbidding the teaching of evolution violated teachers' First Amendment rights to free speech. But Darrow had joined the case in order to confront Brian and the religious fanaticism he represented. On the afternoon of the fourth day of the trial, Darrow brought Maynard Metcalf, a zoologist from Johns Hopkins University, to the stand to testify that evolution was supported by most scientists. Brian heatedly condemned Metcalf's testimony. This in turn provoked a response from one of the defense attorneys, Dudley Malone, in which he compared the fight over evolution versus creationism to the religious ignorance which resulted in the church's persecution of Galileo. Malone's speech was later said to be one of the greatest of the century. On the fifth day, Judge Ralston barred any testimony about science and evolution as inadmissible and irrelevant to the case. 
Darrow and his team went ahead and read into the court record and prepared testimony of eight scientists and four experts on religion. Statements that helped inform the public through the press about the compromised position that evolution could be compatible with enlightened Christianity. On the seventh day, due to the 100 plus degree heat and the 5,000 spectators, the judge moved the trial to the courthouse lawn. On that day, one of the greatest moments in court history occurred. Darrow called Brian to the stand as an expert on the Bible. Darrow persistently asked Brian questions to get him to admit that the Bible was open to interpretation. Brian objected that the purpose of the questioning was to cast ridicule on everybody who believes in the Bible. Darrow retorted that his purpose was to prevent bigots and ignoramuses from controlling the education of the United States. Although the judge ruled that Brian's testimony was irrelevant and should be stricken from the record, it was widely reported as a victory for Darrow. While the conflict helped advance the teaching of evolution, the outcome of the trial was a foregone conclusion. Scopes lost his case, and the judge ordered him to pay a $100 fine. Five days after the end of the trial, William Jennings Bryan died in his sleep. A year and a half later, after the case had been appealed, the Tennessee Supreme Court decided to set aside Scopes' conviction on the grounds that the jury rather than the judge should have set the penalty. In order to keep the case from going to the U.S. Supreme Court, they also recommended that Scopes not be prosecuted further. Tennessee repealed the Butler Act in 1967, but then enacted a compromise law six years later requiring that equal emphasis be given to evolution and biblical creation in education. In 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that an Arkansas law that required the teaching of creationism and banned evolution violated the separation of church and state. And finally, in the 1987 Edwards v. Aguilar decision, the U.S. Supreme Court forbade even the compromise laws that required teaching both creationism and evolution because they also violated the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. In the 1950s anti-communist McCarthy period, the story of the Scopes trial took on a new meaning. Inherit the Wind, a 1955 play and 1960 film, were dramatic interpretations of the Scopes trial that portrayed the town of Dayton as a furious reactionary mob. Though the play and film took many quotes from the trial, they also changed many key facts. In the movie, there's a fundamentalist minister um, who has a daughter who's engaged to the Scopes character. He's called Cates in the movie, but it's Scopes. Um, in fact, the, the people in Dayton um, weren't anywhere near as fanatical um, as the movie shows them, and there wasn't any fundamentalist minister who was leading um, the case against Scopes. And in fact, um, the people on both sides seemed to be on the very best of terms, um, got along just fine. So um, that whole conflict was played up much more for the movie. Intelligent design emerged in the 1990s as a compromise with the Supreme Court's banning of biblical creationism in science classes. Intelligent design only argues that nature is too complex to have evolved on its own and does not introduce explicitly creationist ideas. But this compromise also failed. One of the most recent defeats in the conflict between supporters of creationism and evolution occurred when parents sued the Dover, Pennsylvania school board for trying to have intelligent design taught in the schools in 2004. In 2005, the federal court ruled on the Dover case that teaching intelligent design was the same as teaching creationism and also violated the separation of church and state. And in fact, that Dover, uh, Pennsylvania case, uh, they were <laughs> in some rather neat ways able to show that they were the same thing. They were able to show that uh, some, um, some of the scientific, uh, some of the so-called scientific texts that these people wanted to use, that they, in earlier versions they called it creationism, in the later versions they called it intelligent design. The Scopes trial became one of the greatest turning points in the war between science and religion, evolution and creationism. Despite attempts to teach both side by side, the conflict rages and most likely will rage on, for history has shown that the battle between evolution and creationism cannot end in compromise. Although it's so ridiculous, they're teaching us now that it's true. The teachers that came from a monkey would be better off in a zoo. Whoa, I'm no kin to the monkey, no, no, no. The monkey's no kin to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know much about his ancestors, but mine didn't swing from a tree. It seems so much more believable, and surely, surely it's true. The God made man in his image, no monkey story.